Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf, alongside Nick Wright, Kevin Wilds, Greg Jennings with us. Gentlemen, hope you all had a good weekend. We have a fabulous Monday show for you. Jameis Winston seems to be a man without a plan these days. Nick makes an NBA list that LeBron isn't even on. Wait till you hear that. And Cam Newton is on some kind of mission. That's where we start this morning. Cam, his go-to way of passing the time these days is making declarations on social media. The latest one, well, the former MVP took to Instagram saying, quote, people love a good underdog story. This ain't that. So, Nick, it's an interesting topic. Do you look at Cam Newton as an underdog? Well, at this point, given what the entire league has said about his trade value, about his future as a starting quarterback, he almost by default has turned into an underdog. But he, of course, does not look at himself as an underdog. And you have to totally understand why Cam Newton, his entire life, basically every room he's ever walked into, he's been the most successful person, the most talented person almost always the best-looking person. The last decade, he's also been the most accomplished and the wealthiest person. When that's the normal for you, you don't look at yourself as an underdog. You look at yourself as the overwhelming favorite in all circumstances, especially when you've achieved at the level that Cam has, winning at every level imaginable and coming this close to winning as a pro. It reminded me, Wilds, of LeBron James in... His first year back in Cleveland during the playoff run, even after Kevin Love was out and Kyrie's knee was bothering him, he was asked at a press conference about being an underdog. And he said, who, me? Who, an underdog? No. And I think Cam has a similar mentality, Kevin. So I don't expect him to view himself as an underdog, Wilds. I think he's got a little underdog in him that he's, he's I'm wondering, are you telling me this or are you telling yourself this? I actually think we're seeing a new chapter of Cam Newton. Less Superman, more Iron Man. The first part of his career, all Superman. And Superman's big thing is he can do it himself. National champion, Heisman, Offensive Rookie of the Year, MVP. Most of the Panthers' playbook is like, I don't know, give it to Cam. QB draw. Same as Superman. Superman, there's an asteroid coming to Earth. Like, I got it. I'll just go up and punch it and destroy it. Now I think we're in the Iron Man stage of Cam's career. He's building something. He's in the lab. He's got the the metal, what's it called? The metal mass. It comes down, there's sparks flying out. September 27th in Cam's Instagram, there was the confessional. He's got the cigar and he's got the glass of brandy. Okay, that's September 27th. December 12th, he's got the walking boot on. Since then, there's been over 50 posts, all in black and white, and there's, he's trying to get across three things. One, I'm motivated. Two, I'm working out. Three, I love my family. I think Cam has turned a page. I think he's going to be amazing. And I think the best is yet to come. Greg, let me ask you a question. Underdog is necessarily not necessarily a bad term. We've seen it connected to Tom Brady. The Eagles adopted the underdog mentality. They wrote it all the way to the, the Super Bowl. When you, as a player, hear underdog, do you necessarily, do you look at it as a label? Is it a mentality? Is it a negative thing? From a player's perspective, where are you on this? To answer your question directly, from a player's perspective, you look at it as disrespectful. From a team's perspective, you enjoy being an underdog. Why? Because they're counting you all out. They're saying, basically, this team is one that we don't think can accomplish what they believe. And so when you say that to a team, it kind of galvanizes them. It kind of draws them all together to become one. When you say that to an individual, they tend to bark back. And so I agree 100 percent with what Nick said about Cam himself does not believe he is an underdog. Why? Because he's never been an underdog. He's always been one of the most prolific, talented Um, individuals that step foot on a football field when it comes to his talent and what he can provide, it's top notch. It has always been top notch. And to now say that he is potentially an underdog, it's a slap in the face to him personally, because 
he's never not been the guy. And to Wild's point, I think he is entering into a new phase in his life. When you turn 30, when you start to become labeled differently and teams start to count you out and you feel slightly, I shouldn't even call it a slight disrespect. When you feel disrespect, you start to approach things a little differently. And I think that's Cam's approach in this offseason. And when he goes into the next season, he's going to be lights out. Well, then everything, Nick, that you guys have all described leads to Cam Newton being an underdog. Teams have sort of stopped believing in him, at least his own team did. There doesn't seem to be a a vast market out there for him. He seems like he's kind of angry. Maybe he is an underdog. Has anything you've seen in the last couple of years leading up to where he is right now proven that point? Well, I think angry is maybe the right word for it, Jenner. Not just angry that the franchise that drafted him, the franchise that he took to their only second Super Bowl appearance ever, he won the only league MVP the franchise has to its name, that they disrespected him in the way and the timing in which they released him. But now that he looks back on it, I think he does believe, man, you guys asked me to do everything, and the moment I needed a little bit of help, a little bit of give back, you got rid of me. When Cam Newton was drafted to the Carolina Panthers, they had a star wide receiver named Steve Smith. His first year with Cam, he had nearly 1,400 yards receiving. He's a he's an arguable Hall of Fame caliber talent. After Steve Smith left, who did they surround him with? In years six or two through eight of Cam's career, the leading receiver on the team was Greg Olson four times, Christian McCaffrey once, And Devin Funches once, only once, was the leading receiver actually a receiver. The receivers they drafted were Kaloa Polaris, Joe Adams, Kelvin Benjamin, who Cam brought as far as he possibly could have. And the moment he left Cam, he's out of the league. Devin Funches, who was underachieved, Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore. They never surrounded him with legitimate weapons, which makes the level of success he had all the more impressive. There are only six quarterbacks who have more, five quarterbacks, pardon me, who have more more touchdowns through 125 career games. Aaron Rodgers, Dan Marino, Peyton Manning, Russell Wilson, Brett Favre. All those guys, except for Russ, of course, won MVP. And all those guys have played in either great systems or with great players. You look at other quarterbacks that have won MVPs. Peyton had Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison. Then he had Demarius Thomas. Brady had Moss, then he had Welker, then he had Gronk and Hernandez. All the Matt Ryan had Julio Jones. Cam's out there doing it with Kelvin Benjamin and Greg Olson, who is, while an excellent player, he's a tight end and he's been injured the last few years. And you wonder why his passing numbers aren't more jaw dropping. So if I'm Cam Jenna, I'm upset about the whole situation about how I'm released and then retroactively about them not putting the right receivers around me to reach my full potential. So that's a really interesting point, Nick. Greg, do you think Cam Newton wasn't set up to succeed in Carolina? <laughs> it's It was evident. You look at any other quarterback in this league, and they have had, who's had some success, they pretty much had a level of consistency. Cam Newton's entire career has not been consistent. When you start with just his coaching staff, uh, having a different coordinator, almost six, five coordinators, five or six different coordinators in his career, like that's unprecedented. And so you ask someone to come in every single year and change what we're doing. Listen to this verbiage, take this, and now make it work. This is what Cam Newton was asked to do. And and I'm going to just be honest. Anytime you've been drafted to a team, and you've dedicated everything you have as a player, as an individual, your family, you're vested, you buy in, and then they check out on you? That's like being disrespectful. That's like walking into your house and you've paid, you paid for this house, you purchased the things that are in this house, and then your significant other says, uh, you got to go. And you haven't done... And you might have not washed the dishes or you didn't fold the clothes or what? What? So I do all these other things. I check every single box. And the one time I forget to do something or I'm unable to do it because of injury, you out? 
That's how we do it. That's how players feel disrespected. That's why players have this mentality of I'm in it for myself. And fans don't understand it. They want to act like it's all about players being selfish. Well, it's teams that are selfish. Because one thing about organizations is they're going to look out for the benefit of themselves. But when a player does it, it's problematic and it's selfish and it's frowned upon. I don't like it. Cam Newton has every right to feel disrespected from a team that he gave everything to. From a team, as Nick alluded to, that he literally brought back to a level of consistency and just notoriety. Like, no one was thinking about the Carolina Panthers until Cam arrived back in town. So I, I'm all on Cam bandwagon here. He has every right to feel a certain way, however that way is, fill it. Greg's takeaway this morning, make sure you do your laundry. Right, Greg. You don't know where you're going to be living the next day. We got them all fired <laughs> up this morning. <laughs> Order delivery with DoorDash and take back time in your day to finish that novel, shred that workout, or clean that cupboard. DoorDash brings all of America's flavors to your door. Ordering is easy. Open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat. Your food will be delivered to you wherever you are. Not only is your favorite pizza joint already on DoorDash, but there are over 310,000 restaurant partners in 4,000 cities. So you might find a new favorite too. With door-to-door -door delivery in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia, you can order from your local go-tos or choose from your favorite national restaurants like Chipotle, Wendy's, Chick-fil-A, and the Cheesecake Factory. With DoorDash, you'll never have to worry about your next meal. Right now, our listeners can get $5 off their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter code F. TF. That's $5 off your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code FTF. Don't forget, that's code FTF for $5 off your first order with DoorDash. Back here on First Things First, it is time for Drawing a Blank. So Antonio Brown took to Instagram Live yesterday to remind everyone just how good he is. And don't worry, you don't have to read between the lines here. A.B. said flat out, I'm the best receiver in the game. Tell Julio to look up the stats. Nick, Antonio Brown calling out Julio Jones is blank. Semi-accurate. I mean, A.B. does have an argument what? that while he was in the game, he was the best receiver in the game. Over his career, he's got... I think 17 more touchdowns than Julio, more catches, and he's only shy of like 800 yards. But the reason it's not fully accurate and only semi-accurate is the in-the-game part of it. Julio is still actually <laughs> in the game, while Antonio Brown is, of course, not actually in the game. So it's almost there, but not quite there, Greg Jennings. Yeah, I hear you on that. I'm calling it a Hail Mary. And it's a Hail Mary for the team that is down, have no chance, but they're still forcing their offense to stay out on the field just to prove a point. This is Antonio's Brown. It's like he's trying to get a team to latch on to him and stay relevant. And it's just not happening. And for him to attack Julio Jones, who is very respectful to teammates, who is just the consummate pro when it comes to being on the sideline, a wide receiver, not considered a diva, that's not the right guy to attack. Boom, me and Greg, mind meld via the uh, Zero machine that we have. I'm going irrelevant. Antonio Brown, we've got two months of quarantine. Just take your phone, here's an example. Take your phone, throw it out. It's, you've yet to do anything that has helped your case. Just be done. It's irrelevant, Jenna. No more Antonio Brown phone talk, please. Could not agree with you more. Moving on. Uh, let's talk some Deshaun Watson, who will be quite relevant this season. His newest weapon, Randall Cobb, said he chose the Texans over the Cowboys because Watson is a, quote, winner. No offense, other quarterbacks he could have been referring to. Nick, the best way to describe Deshaun Watson is blank. A Bronx Tale, the great movie A Bronx Tale, Chaz Palminteri's story of his life. What's the most memorable line from A Bronx Tale? It's when C's father says to him, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And unfortunately, 
That's the path Deshaun Watson appears to be on, thanks to the incompetence of leadership down in Houston. For years, he doesn't have an offensive line. Then they get rid of his best receiver. Bill O'Brien's his coach, his GM, and his emperor. So when I see Deshaun Watson, I think a Bronx tale. The saddest thing in life, Greg, is wasted talent. I had a feeling we weren't going to get through this part in this question without you mentioning Bill O'Brien somehow. But when it comes to Deshaun Watson, he's simply an achiever. You know, Randall Cobb called him a winner, so I'm going to call him an achiever. He understands how to achieve greatness and success. Very few players have this knack about him. He does. He was in recently in an interview where he was talking about quarterbacks and being in his fraternity and being able to converse with all these different quarterbacks and then being asked uh, by NBA, former NBA player Jason Williams. It was the boardroom, by the way, that what was the conversations about? He said about winning Super Bowls. And then he goes on to say, because I know I'm going to win one. Like that's his mentality. That's something that great people have when they know and understand how to achieve success. Nick, I'm going to toss this one back to you. I'm going to say that he's magnetic, but I don't think Randall Cobb made the right decision by going to the Texans because we all know, remember that article last week, Nick? Who's the team favored to get Deshaun Watson in 2021? Uh, Say it. No, no, don't kick it back to me. Say it. It's not the Patriots. It, yeah, that's how yeah, I, broke, I broke no, the format. Not, no. I broke the format. No, no, no I'm not responding. Let's I, go. I'm, I'm putting the format back together. No, Jenna, please go. Please <laughs> go, Jenna. I will. I, I didn't hear anything you said because I, I, I'm the only one that hasn't watched Bronx Tale. But I'm going to watch it and then let's have the same discussion tomorrow. Uh, let's talk some Cowboys oh now. Pro Football God. Focus gave Dallas. I know. I know. I know. Uh, I also have to watch The Sopranos. Uh, PFF gave Dallas a free agency grade of above average. But the team's still working on a long-term deal for Dak. So, Nick, the Cowboys' offseason has been blank. Let's focus just on the question because I know where your head's at. No, no, no. I'm not going to. Of course, you've watched Seinfeld 11,000 times. You watch The Office. You watch (laughs) Princess Bride 46 (laughs) times. You don't have time for a Bronx Tale or The Sopranos. I mean, a very busy schedule. Okay, to answer the Cowboys question, though, the Cowboys offseason has been underrated because they did not get a deal done with Dak. I think two of the better defensive signings any team made as far as value and talent were made by the Cowboys. Ha ha Clinton Dix for four million dollars reuniting with Mike McCarthy is a steal. And I love Gerald McCoy. Jenna, you love Gerald McCoy. Why? Because he was on hard knocks once and he seems like a good guy. But he also is a great, a very, very good defensive tackle. And getting him locked in along that defensive line to offset some of the other losses, I think, is is an excellent move by them. I know they would have liked to keep Byron Jones, but the Dolphins paid him so much money, he can't do it. So, Greg, I think the Cowboys offseason is a little underrated when you look at it in its totality rather than just did they get Dak re-signed or not. Well, I'm going to look at it from that lens, and I'm going to call it perplexing. Why? Because when we look at the National Football League, who's the most important player on the football field? The quarterback. And when you don't guarantee your quarterback has a contract and he's going to be locked in, the locker room is just different. There will always be a buzz. There's going to be chatter within that locker room. I don't think that this is going to be the way that they want to go proceeding. You have to lock in your quarterback or key players in your quarterback. In this case, you locked in Amari Cooper. You locked in your running back, Ezekiel Elliott, last year. And you decide, nope, we're just going to tag you, uh, Dak Prescott. That's going to be problematic. Jenna, Nick is right about The Sopranos. You definitely need to watch it. We have nothing to do. It's a a nice, it'll eat up a lot of time. He's also right about how Clinton Dix. Uh, reuniting with Mike McCarthy. The best year he's ever had was with him. So I think it's going to be the Dallas defense is special, and you should watch the Sopranos at the same time. Hey, guys, in my defense, I've been busy with Joe Exotic and Tiger King for the last couple of days, so I will get yeah, to Bronx yeah, Tale and fair. Sopranos. Let's move on what to... What have you been busy with for the last New England years. Patriots now. Sopranos been off the air for a decade. It. You're blaming it on. on Tiger King. With Tom Brady in the rear view mirror, <laughs> this is Jared Stidham's team now, at least according to his former high school football coach, who believes Stidham can handle the starting job. So, Nick, 
Not big shoes to fill at all. The Patriots quarterback situation right now is blank. Delightful. I love it so much. Please yeah. give me all the stories about Jared Stidham's high school coach. I had Jared Stidham's father-in-law tell me he was the best backup in the league last year, and so I'm excited. I'm going to put that story out there. Can we get a Cody Kessler story, maybe? What about a Brian Hoyer story? I, 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 give me as many of these as possible. As long as the Patriots quarterback story does not involve the two words Cameron Newton, I love him. Because the Patriots are about to enter the wilderness that I lived in for my whole life as a Chiefs fan, absent when Patrick Mahomes came in those couple years we had Montana, where it's like, wait, our quarterbacks, what? Huh? It's the world the Jets have been living in and the Dolphins have been living in and the Bills have been living in. And it is so delightful, Greg, that the Patriots appear to be living in it now. So that's my answer. Delightful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's it's open. It is open. They don't really know who their quarterback is going to be. They can say Stidham, Brian Hoyer. They were sniffing around with Kyle Allen. They're going to be snooping around and trying to figure out what Cam Newton's number is going to look like. They're going to they're weighing every single option. So it's open. Kevin, you're the fan of the Pats. Where are they going? I'm not sure. And I'm not worried about it. <laughs> I would say that we're drama free. No drama. Whatever Bill Belichick decides will be fine. Maybe it's Stidham. Maybe it's Hoyer. Maybe it's Cam Newton. Maybe it's Jameis. Maybe Tom Brady breaks his contract and comes back to New England. Either way, drama free. Maybe that's we're fine, everybody. Don't drinking. worry about it. Who knows? There's a good chance we broke Kevin Wilds. <laughs> Uh, on to Cleveland now, where former Browns quarterback Jake DeLome raised a few eyebrows when he said this, quote, don't be surprised if you see Case Keenum come November if Baker struggles. Nick Baker getting benched for Keenum would be blank. Absolutely ludicrous. Case Keenum is a smaller, less talented version of Baker Mayfield. They have all the same flaws, except Keenum's are worse, and the same skill set, except Baker's is so much higher. It would be like saying, hey, Nick, you might get replaced on first things first with a different guy with just worse hair, a bigger nose, and more of an infatuation with LeBron James. Like, wait, what, huh? You're just going to get the word? It doesn't make sense. So, no, like, it's if you're going to say Baker could be benched, so be it. But not for the worst version of himself. So it's ludicrous. No. Uh, Man, how disrespectful you have just been towards Case Keenum. I, it would be jolting. It would really be jolting. I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be jolting simply because all of what happened last year and what Baker Mayfield was incapable of doing. I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he is a young quarterback and he did not have a tight end to really consistently throw to. He now has two. I think he bounces back, and I don't think it happens. It would be jolting. I hate to say it. When I first saw this question, I said, what? And then I read a little bit. I was like, uh-oh, this is going to happen. This is going to not be surprising, Nick. Keenan went 11-3 and with Stefanski as his quarterback's coach in 2017. All the articles are like, they speak the same language. They finish each other's sentences. This is on the horizon and no one's talking about it. I'm, I, I'd be nervous if I was Baker, Jenna. Uh, I'm so... I'm, Wilds, Wilds, I wrote not no surprising idea. on here. Yeah. You have no idea what you've just opened up with the wonderful Jenna Wolf. You're relatively new to the team yeah. and you've been a great addition. But yeah. now that you have kicked the door slightly open... For Jenna to rejoin the Case Keenum bandwagon that 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 crashed in a fire two years ago, it's over now. Now every Case Keenum possible story or headline, Jenna's gonna try to work <laughs> into right. the show. I blame you for this, and you exclusively. Right. I can't believe what you've done. Oh, no, I didn't even right, think Jenna. this was a thing, no. and now I'm riding it all the no, way to it's through. It's it. uh, we gotta it's take a break. A Back here, first things first, talking some Jameis Winston now. Coming off a 30 interception season. Nick, you're a bit on delay, so I'm going to say it for you. That ain't great. A recent Tampa Bay Times column <laughs> isn't helping, saying teams, quote, don't like what they see when evaluating Jameis in free agency. Nick, you surprised Winston's market is looking bleak? 
Not really. I think Colin Cowherd has it right when he says three things in life you don't want to go cheap on. He says toilet paper, very apropos for the times, transportation, and quarterbacks. And I think people look at Jameis as not only the cheap option, but uh, the unreliable option in that regard. And here's the other thing, Wilds, that is really working against Jameis. Who are the teams that need a quarterback? There's only one team in the league we know needs a quarterback. Miami, but they think they're probably drafting one. The Chargers, we believe, need a quarterback, but they seem to like Tyrod. The Jags, I believe, need a quarterback, but they've got Jenna's BFF, Gardner Minshew. The Broncos assuredly need a quarterback, but John Elway's there, so he probably loves Drew Locke. So what is the market if he wants to be a starting quarterback? There's not a lot of teams right now, Wilds, that actually think they need one. I totally agree. I, I want to read a Bruce Arians quote. I've got two Bruce Arians quotes. I want to read this one verbatim. This is from the Tampa Bay Times. <clears throat> Describing, Bruce Arians describes uh, Jameis' tenure with the Bucks. There's so much good and so much outright terrible. So I think that's your former <laughs> coach talking. And then when Arians was on with Rich Eisen the other day, there was a little piece of unintentional comedy where he was saying how great of a guy Jameis is. He works so hard, et cetera, et cetera. He says he reached out to some teams. And Rich is like, you did? I, you know, I know you probably won't tell me what teams. He's like, what was the reaction? And uh, <laughs> Rich Arians says, uh, one team was not interested, and one team said, thanks for calling. So, like, that's it. I don't think the market's that big, and I don't think Bruce Arians doing a great job selling his guy that he's just a fantastic fit for your team. Hey, Greg, let me ask you something. It seems like Jameis is as good as he is bad, and that's the problem. When you get excited about his upside, you're brought back down to reality because of his downside. He's kind of like, in my Seinfeld knowledge he's kind of like even steven but that's not oh, good enough go. to be a starting quarterback on any of the teams when there's when there aren't that many slots to begin with am i right yeah but i'm i'm shocked that no one has taken a chance on Jameis winston because typically when you have a guy who is very talented and who can provide you such a great upside kind of high risk um high reward you tend to get coaches that feel like i can be the coach that fixed that and so if I'm looking at coaches that could potentially fix it, who have situations, because I don't believe that James Winston, obviously, as Nick put it, is going to go into a situation where he's going to be the outright starter. He's going to have to earn a spot. You can look at a team like the Dallas Cowboys, who have a Mike McCarthy, who Whoa. understands how to work with guys and kind of get them to understand defenses to better suit their ability to be accurate and to be have more the better decision-making processes when having the ball in their hands. Now, I don't think that'll happen, but he has to go to a guy that can bring that out of him. And a lot of people thought that that was going to be Bruce Arians, and it wasn't. And I think that's what's really becoming a turnoff for a lot of these NFL teams, the fact that Bruce Arians could not do anything positive with Jameis Winston. If not Bruce, then who, Nick? Well, I, first of all, I, Greg's point about the Cowboys, I think, is a really interesting one, not only because of the McCarthy angle, but if you're, it would be a little, you know, cold war against Dak. Like, oh, you don't want to sign this $115 million deal. Yeah, a former fourth-round pick. Well, how about we bring in a former number one overall pick to back you up? Huh. May, does that maybe get Dak back to the negotiating table? But the team that I think makes sense has a need, is used to a quarterback, maybe not being in the best of shape and throwing a bunch of picks. How about the Pittsburgh Steelers? What about sitting behind Ben for a year and then maybe not for a full year if Ben's elbow is not fully recovered? You've got that great defense, Jenna. You have that excellent head coach, Mike Tomlin. You've never had a losing season. They need a backup quarterback because it's not the Duck and it's not Mason Rudolph. So to me... The Pittsburgh, as a backup, maybe one day heir apparent, Jenna, for Jameis makes a lot of sense. I like it. How about the fact that Jameis and Cam, that. both former number one overall picks, both still available as quarterbacks in free agency?
Now time for stories to start your morning. Bleacher Report released their top 25 under 25 list with Nick's adult Slovenian son, Luka Doncic, at the top of it. Nick, I am guessing you've got a list of your own. I do, and I, I had the top 25 under 25 as well, but they said I could only do a top 10, so let's do 10. We'll go oddly right to left. Devin Booker's at number 10. Listen, nobody can deny the, uh, what a great scorer he is, but it's been five years of his career. Is it too much to ask Devin Booker to win 30 games? How about, forget the playoffs, how about 30 games? De'Aaron Fox is number nine on the list. I think Fox is wildly underrated. He almost carried the Kings to a winning season last year. He is, he's dealt with bad coaching. He's dealt with bad uh, general managing, yet he's still, I think, one of the most underrated and best young players in the league. Trey Young, he is the best version he could have been at this point in his NBA career. His collegiate scoring translated immediately to the pros. He obviously has to improve defensively. And then there's Carl Anthony Towns. Carl Anthony Towns, his second year in the league was 25 and 12. This year, he's what is he, 26 and 11, 41% from three. So why isn't he higher? You just need to see a little more team success and hit him to mesh better with teammates. So there's my seven through 10, Kevin Wilds. Yeah, I, I like this. I think Book's a little bit low. I wonder about Trey Young, though. I think by some defensive metrics, he's literally the worst defensive player in the league. So, Nick, I'm wondering how high you think he can move up or how good at defense can he actually get? Well, he can, listen, he, he, his best case defensively is can he get to Steph Curry defensively, which is a below average but not horrific defender. And if he continues being a 30-point-a-game guy, then you can deal with it. Greg, what do you think of this 7 through 10? Um, You know, I like it. I, I personally think that Carl Anthony Towns is a little bit high, being able to see him kind of up close in person. But I will challenge you on finding a way to get Bam out of Bayou in your top 10. I know this oh, is his wrong. rookie year, one year wonder so far, but he is spectacular. He is a star. He's a budding star, an all-star, and he's not top 10. How, Nick? Uh, it, Bam, Bam was on the cutting room floor, I will admit. But now we will get to the top six. All right, well, at least three through six, if we can move on to the next slide, if we will. Number six, Jason Tatum. Nobody ever say I underrate Jason we Tatum go. again. Oh, my God, he was the sixth best player under 25 in the league. Excellent two-way player. And we have seen that while he has had some tough playoff moments, also some excellent playoff moments, and those matter. You'll see the same thing with Ben Simmons. Ben Simmons, we spend so much time focused on what he doesn't do well. Look at Jason Tatum getting around the defender. Ben Simmons, we spend so much time focused on what he doesn't do well instead of all the things defensively, passing, getting to the rim, rebounding that he does on an A level and a guy who we saw in the playoffs last year have a monster game when Joel Embiid was out. And now we get to the real cream of the crop. Number four, Donovan Mitchell. People forget about him because he's in Utah. His rookie season... In a closeout playoff game on a court with Russell Westbrook and Paul George, he was the best guy, dropping 38 points. He's He's been the best player on a playoff team every year of his career thus far. He's number four. Number three, some people would take issue with, that I have jawed this high already. I admit some of this is projection, but you can just see it with him. And a Memphis team that Wilds' beloved Boston Celtics thought the pick they had from this year was going to be a top three pick. Turns out, if, the, if we do finish the season, it's not even going to be a lottery pick because he's carried Memphis to the postseason despite the loss of Jaron Jackson Jr. for a chunk of the season. Ja barely or j finishes out three through ten. I know Ja hasn't accomplished as much as the other guys, but to me, there's three through six. Wilds? I actually kind of think that Simmons is like super underrated here. Like, don't you think he has a chance at being, I don't know, top five players in the league, Nick? You've got him down as the, what is it, hold on, the fifth best under 25? It, it just feels weird to me. Yeah, I, I used to think he had a chance to be a top five player in the league. I used to think he could be a league MVP because he hasn't improved even 5% on his willingness to shoot. 
He's kind okay. of stuck in That's neutral. Fair. But again, I don't want to focus on what he doesn't do well for these purposes because we spend too much time on that. And his defense is wildly underrated. Greg, any omissions, any issues with three through six? No omissions. I would just switch around. I would take John Morant and move him to six. Uh, take Donovan Mitchell and yeah. move him to five. Um, and then Jason Tatum, four. And Ben Simmons, three. But I like it. Yeah. Wow. A lot of love for Jason Tatum there. And then the top two. We all know the top two. It's Luca, Zion. Zion, Luca. Who do you, how do you have it? Listen, Luke is number one. He has to be number one. He is averaging. Look at what he's averaging. 29, 9, and 9 if we round. Do you know the full list of players who've averaged that in a season? Oscar Robertson, Russell Westbrook, and Luka Doncic. That's the list, the complete list. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If Luka never improves at all, he'll win an MVP or two. And then there's Zion Williamson, who's a guy who stepped into the league coming off an injury, and he's giving you 24 a night on 59% shooting. He is everything we could have hoped for and more. He's another guy that will improve, but if he never improves, if this is just his stat line for his career, he's a first ballot, no doubt, Hall of Famer. So Luka Doncic won, wow. Zion Williamson two, Wilds, what do you say? Okay, so speaking of improvement, if everything breaks right for all of these guys, all 10 of these guys, and we do this list again in five years, without redoing the whole list, who's the most interesting player that maybe moves up or moves down if, every, if it all breaks right for everybody, Nick? If it all breaks right for everyone, the answer is Zion. Because if it all breaks right for Zion and he stays healthy and develops a shot, then he's Giannis. And that means you're the one of the two best players in the league and a league MVP and just a dominant, overwhelming force. My only concern, Greg, for Luka is, is he basically already at his ceiling? Like how much more when you've been playing pro ball since you were 15 and you're this well-rounded already, how much room for improvement is there? But it, my answer would be Zion because Zion does have best player in the league potential. Greg, what do you say? I like these two and I like Luka right where you have him. And if this is his ceiling, Nick, he is so good. He is so far above the rest of the guys so far that I think his ceiling is out of reach for a lot of these guys, even if they continue to grow and improve as young basketball players. Luka Doncic, Doncic is a special, unique individual. And it's and it's coming by way of, of an assassin slash just savage. I, I love everything about him. If he, if he stays right where he is, he's going to be one of the greatest players to play. All right. Jenna, take it away. I forgot what order we were going in. So I got, I got so wrapped up in the conversation, I thought there was going to be more. Uh, let's talk some football now. Oh, here we go. Tom Brady was finally introduced to his newest Bucks weapon, Chris Godwin. Unfortunately, it wasn't in person. It came via FaceTime. Greg, are there any advantages to virtual chemistry between these two as opposed to, say, the real kind of chemistry you want to see on the field? I feel like there is some advantages to virtual chemistry. We have virtual chemistry. Nick, Jenna, oh. Kevin, Greg, oh. we're doing this virtual that? thing. Oh. We have chemistry. Oh, we have virtual there's, chemistry. There's definitely a benefit That's great, Greg. to it. I can feel you. Wilds? Um, I guess, Greg, the... Yeah, I, I don't know. I, Greg, you're the you're the expert on being the wide receiver of the crew. If we if we take the word chemistry out and we talk about timing and things like that, <laughs> how far do you think Tom Brady's chemistry again timing uh, will be behind the eight ball now that he's not having any face to face practice sessions with these guys? Um, maybe a little bit, but when you look at a, a quarterback who is as proven and who has uh, the miles that Tom Brady has, it really is a matter of him seeing how those guys move. A lot of people talk about timing. Is it important? Yes. But you have really good individuals at the skill position in Godwin and Evans, and you have a quarterback that has seen a lot of routes. It is going to be just about seeing what their little uh, idiosyncrasies are 
off the line of scrimmage and then their breaking points and what they do before they get into their route at the top. And I know I'm wiggling because I'm like, I'm trying to run my route. But at the top of the routes, little telltale signs for quarterbacks are huge. Once he can identify those, their timing will be just fine. Uh, it, l- All right, I'll let's be talk quick some here. Carmelo Anthony I, here. I think the okay. Go ahead, Nick. Sorry, Jenna. Let no. Let's talk Carmelo. You're right. Talk Carmelo. I wasn't. I don't really want to talk about Brady anymore. Anyway, <laughs> go ahead, please. <laughs> the more Brady talk. We all know that that's not true. <laughs> Love the guy. When Melo was drafted third overall by the Nuggets back in 2003, the sky was the limit, but it ultimately led to no hardware. And Melo was now saying that he would have won two or three rings had the Pistons drafted him second overall. Love it. Nick, your thoughts? Melo's wrong, and I love him. Listen, Melo brought my university, Syracuse, its greatest moment, its only championship, delivered Jim Beheim to the promised land, and Melo's been a great guy throughout his career. However... You have to recognize what happened because the Pistons blew that pick. Because they drafted Darko, they then went and acquired Rashid Wallace, who one could argue was the most important and most valuable player on that championship team and for the next few years thereafter. If they had Mellow Wilds, they would have never gotten Sheed. And as good as Mellow was, he wasn't yet Rashid Wallace at that point in his career. So I love Melo, and I understand what he's saying, but I think he's wrong because the Pistons wouldn't have acquired the key to that five-year near dynasty they had, winning a title, getting to another Game 7 of NBA Finals Wilds without Rasheed Wallace. They wouldn't have gotten him if they had drafted Melo. I know, but let's just assume Rasheed ends up on the team somehow and Melo's on that team. I think I'd like to support Melo. I think he would have three rings. I think it's just more fun to imagine a world where Melo has rings in Detroit. Man, I'm from Michigan, and we took Darko Milicic. Are you kidding me? Man, we needed Melo. <laughs> we would have had three, maybe four, maybe five, six. It oh, kept five going. now, Nick. Six. <laughs> six, Greg, come on. So, yeah, seven uh, rings. Right. Let's move on to the ten Chiefs. Rings. With six, six, seven rings. Maybe five. 12. Could have had 12 rings. Uh, the Chiefs resigned wide on the market for the second weekend. Rings. Patrick Mahomes oh, was here we very go. excited, tweeting hashtag run it back. So, Greg, the Chiefs a lot to win again this coming season? I mean, it's hard to, to pick against the Kansas City Chiefs when you look at the New England Patriots and them not having Tom Brady. Uh, you look at Deshaun Watson down in Houston, them not having DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, the only other team that they really have to concern themselves with right now is the Baltimore Ravens as far as their path to getting back to the Super Bowl. So, yeah, I think they definitely are the favorites. I don't know. Super Bowl hangover, Nick. Be careful. You know Super Bowl champions sometimes don't even make the playoffs. Be wary with that back-to-back talk. Save that for the Stop Patriots. Stop it. All right, let me let me Stop sip it. my tea first. Hold on. Here we go. Well, I just bask in this question. (laughs) That this question exists that we're discussing about the Chiefs going back to back. Now, first of all, Super Bowl hangover applies to Super Bowl losers, not Super Bowl winners quite often. I know you get it confused, Wilds, because you guys lost three Super Bowls in the last 20 years, but we don't talk about that. (laughs) Uh, But listen, are they a lock? My commitment to take integrity, Jenna, makes it to where I cannot call them a lock. The Ravens are too good. Are they a lock to be back in the discussion? For, oh, I don't know, the next decade? Of course, because they've got this guy right here. So, of course, they're a lock in that regard. That's it. (laughs) We got to go. You're done already? Good stuff today, guys. We're back here tomorrow morning. Hope you join us. Stay safe. See you then.